Well, we want to once again welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. We are so glad that you are here physically and virtually. Praise the Lord for those that look on and just thank God for you as well. Pray that the Lord will keep you safe and soon you'll be able to come back to be with us uh, in person. But until then, you just keep watching online and be comfortable. All right, being that this is Good Friday, well, Good Friday is in a couple days. We won't be here. I wanted to do a special message on the glorious cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to look tonight at the purpose of the cross. The power of the cross, the shame of the cross, the declaration of the cross, the demarcation of the cross, and finally, the foolishness of the cross. First of all, the purpose of the cross. Now, most of our time will be in Matthew chapter 27. So you will open your Bibles to Matthew 27. Verse 27, Matthew 27, 27. <clears throat> then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium. That was like a barracks for Roman soldiers. And gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. A cohort. That is like a battalion. It's a group of 600 soldiers. 600 Roman soldiers gathered around Jesus. They stripped him. Put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him, put his own garments back on him, and led him away to crucify him. Now this is hard to read. It's difficult to read because it confronts us with the horror of the cross and the tremendous suffering Jesus underwent for us. It also helps us to see the purpose of the crucifixion. What is the purpose of the cross? Was Jesus simply a victim? Was he a martyr? What was the purpose of it all? First of all, to bear the sins of the world. We get that in verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Scarlet. Kind of like red. Red. Now, about 600 years before the cruci 700 years before the crucifixion, Isaiah made a prophecy about this. Isaiah chapter 1. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the crucifixion of Christ, said this. In Isaiah 1, verse 18, 
regarding the scarlet robe, the red robe. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet. They will be white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. So your sins are as scarlet. Your sins, it's like you have blood on your hands. You have blood on your hands, scarlet. Your sins are as scarlet. Jesus wore a scarlet robe. Now that's, a, that's not just a coincidence. That's not just a coincidence that he wore a scarlet robe in Matthew 27. That is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, thus Jesus wore a scarlet robe. In other words, he took our sins upon himself. You see, he was sinless. He was the sinless son of God. But he died as a substitute for you and me. For you and I. He died so that we can live. He went into death so that we can have eternal life. He's the substitute. So the purpose of the cross. To bear the sins of the world. Secondly, to satisfy the holiness of God. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, that's 12 noon. So this coming Friday at 12 noon, it starts. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour three o'clock that's when Jesus died he died at three o'clock from the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a hard verse to try to interpret. How could God forsake God? How could God the Father forsake God the sun and why did darkness descend upon the earth for three hours the last three hours Jesus hung on the cross why was it completely dark well some have said it went dark because God was trying to hide the shame of his son but I think more appropriately, it was dark because God turned his back. That's why Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? Now think about this. Throughout all eternity, this was the first and only time that there was a separation between God the Son and God the Father. This was the only time there was separation. Jesus was experiencing separation from his father because when he hung on the cross as the sin bearer, he did it alone. And God turned his back because the eyes of God are too pure to behold sin. Jesus became sin. God turned his back because in his holiness, he could not gaze upon sin. Habakkuk 1.13. 2 Corinthians talks about this. Chapter, chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 
Should be a great verse to memorize right here. He made him who knew no sin, sinless, Jesus, to be sin. When? On the cross. He became sin on the cross. On our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. This is called the great exchange. He took our sin, gave us His righteousness. Now we are more than just forgiven. We are righteous. That's more than just being forgiven. He gave us His righteousness and now we have the righteous standing before God. He sees us as righteous. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So the purpose of the cross was to bear the sins of the world and to satisfy the holiness of God. And thirdly, to make access to God possible. Back in Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus cried, out with a, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. Now, this is interesting because on the cross, usually those that die on a cross have usually been up on that cross for days and their life slowly leaves them, gradually. And at the end of their life, they're so weak, they can't say anything. Their life just leaves them gradually and slowly. Here we see Jesus crying out with a loud voice. With a loud voice. His life wasn't just taken from him. He surrendered it. And at the right time, he died. And he was still strong. Strong because he could cry out with a loud voice. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, something dramatic took place. The veil of the temple, this thick, heavy, 30 foot tall, weaved veil. This is not like the curtains you have in your front room. This was a thick, heavy, huge, weaved curtain. 30 foot tall, all the way down to the ground. All the way down. Must have weighed quite a bit. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. How could that happen? How could the veil... Now what was this veil for? This was the veil used to separate the holy place from the holy of holies. Behind that veil was where God dwelt. And only once a year could a human being go behind that veil. The high priest. God could not be approached by regular mortals. Only the high priest once a year could go behind that veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. He represented the people, but the people did not have access to God. Well, when Christ died, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now we learn from Hebrews what that veil entailed. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place. I mean, you can now enter the presence of God. Yes. Why? The veil was torn. Access is now available. We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. 
by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh Jesus flesh was also torn metaphorically his flesh was torn his flesh is called the veil the physical veil in the temple was torn and the writer to the Hebrew says Jesus flesh was torn his flesh was like the veil granting through its tearing access to God now we have direct access we have direct access the purpose of the cross to make access to God possible pretty miraculous you don't have to go through the high priest you can go every day multiple times a day you have direct access to the throne of grace matter of fact God waits for you he waits for you you know what the sad thing is half the time we don't go we don't go to the throne of grace we don't have time Jesus came and died on the cross so you could have access make make use of that privilege I was thinking about the times we live in we're all complaining man the gyms are closed we can't go to the gym now they're open how many times have you gone <laughs> you should be going every day but none of us do we, we were complaining about it we were complaining about the churches being closed now they're open I don't see the church filled so it's kind of like there's access available to God now make use of that make use of it that's the purpose of the cross Jesus Christ went to the cross to bear our sins and to satisfy the holiness of God and to make access to God possible now the power of the cross Matthew 27 27 32 as they were coming out they found a man of Cyrene where's Cyrene North Africa maybe modern-day Libya maybe the border between Egypt and Libya Cyrene they found a man of Cyrene named Simon whom they pressed into service to bear his cross Jesus was too weakened and fatigued to carry <coughs> excuse me his own cross so they saw this big hefty man and they said you know what carry it he had no choice he had no choice now mark mark's account of this gives us a little added detail mark 15 mark 15 now Simon of Cyrene was a Jewish man he was a pilgrim as many Jews that lived outside of Jerusalem during that time they lived all over the world they would come to Jerusalem for Passover and that's what that's why he was there he was a Jew and he had come from Cyrene and made the trip to Jerusalem because of Passover now Mark 15 21 says they pressed he didn't volunteer they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country Simon of Cyrene now here's the detail the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross so okay so he was the father of Rufus kind of a strange name not very common but we find that name in Romans chapter 16 verse 13 don't worry I got a point I'm trying to make here just follow along with this detective work 
So Simon had a son named Rufus. We see Rufus here at the end of Romans. Greet Rufus. A choice man in the Lord. So Rufus became a Christian. Also his mother. That would be Simon's wife. His mother and mine. Paul considered Simon's wife, Rufus's mother, his mother, his second mom. Now, how did all this happen? Well, Simon of Cyrene from North Africa, big strong man, uh, a Jewish man, probably dark skinned, he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover. While he's there, Jesus is being crucified, and the Roman soldiers force him to bear the cross, which was such a powerful experience for him. He becomes a follower of Jesus. His son Rufus becomes a choice man in the Lord. So they are a Christian family now, and Paul meets them and gets so close to them that he considers Rufus's mother, his mother. That's the power of the cross to transform people. He was pressed into service. Now, keep that imagery in your mind to be pressed into service. Because we are we we are pressed into service. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. First, next time you're pressed into service, don't get mad. You're like Simon of Cyrene. Next time somebody around here asks you to do something, don't get mad. Just say, I'm like Simon of Cyrene. I didn't volunteer, but I got pressed into it, and I'm going to do it for the glory of God. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Christ put me into service. He pressed me into service. I didn't volunteer, I was drafted. I was drafted. Those of you that were ever drafted, I think, John, you were drafted, right? You didn't volunteer, you were drafted. I volunteered draft, so I got there early. Okay, so you were going to get drafted, then you said I volunteer, so. Yeah, took me in early. All right. Well, some people volunteer and some are drafted. Jesus Christ presses you into service. And whenever that happens, say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like Simon of Cyrene. He didn't volunteer. He was pressed into service and it changed his life. Changed his life. And his whole family became believers. And his son Rufus became a choice man in the Lord. And Paul got so close to that family. He said, your mom is like my mom. Now, the shame of the cross. Back in Matthew 27, 35. Twenty-seven thirty-five, And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves. Wait a minute. They took his clothes and they divided them. Oh, what was he wearing? They took his clothes. He wasn't wearing anything. He was naked. Maybe he had a loincloth, but they probably took that too. These were, these were soldiers, they took his garments and they started to cast lots to divide up his clothes. That's why crucifixion was such a shameful way to die. Now usually capital punishment for the Jews was stoning. 
That was much more preferable than crucifixion. Because crucifixion was not only painful, but it was shameful. It was designed by, I believe, the Persians to inflict the greatest pain and the greatest shame. Because you hung up there and you weren't way up there. You were, you were right here. You were right there. People can spit on you, assault you, tell you things, and you were just there. It was a shameful way to die. They took his clothes. They didn't even give him the dignity of allowing him to die with his clothes on. The shame of the cross. That's why Galatians in chapter 3 talks about the cross. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written in Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The cross was a tree. It was comprised of dead wood. So it was a tree. Cursed is everyone who who hangs on a tree. Cursed way to die. Now when you think about trees, we talked about trees. Trees are very important in the Bible. How did sin enter into the world? Through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So sin entered the world through a tree. How was sin paid for? Through a tree. A cross. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And how is sin ultimately removed? Through a tree. The tree of life. So you've got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You've got the tree of the cross. And you've got the tree... Of life. So trees are important. So the shame. Now, next time you are tempted to become ashamed of Christ, just think about him hanging on the cross for you. That's why in 2 Timothy chapter 1, <coughs> verse 8, it says here. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed. And then in verse 12. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Jesus hung on the cross. He died a shameful death so that you could have a glorious life. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. He wasn't ashamed of you. Now the declaration of the cross. We'll go to John for this. John chapter 19. John 19, verse 19. <clears throat> Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. Now, he probably did this to get back at the Jews for them pressuring him to crucify an innocent man. He said... And he, they made a plaque and they put it on the cross. It is written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. So in his attempt to offend the Jews, he declares 
what the cross was all about. Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in three languages. Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Pontius Pilate in his attempt to ridicule and offend the Jews put on the cross in three different languages who Jesus was. The king of the Jews. Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. <coughs> Hebrew is the, the language of religion. Latin is the language of power. That's what the Romans spoke. And Greek is the language of culture. So you've got represented there on the cross three different languages all translated Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now John chapter 18 talks about a dialogue Jesus had with Pilate. John 18 verse 33. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium, the barracks, and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Probably mocking him. Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this, wor not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Are you a king? Yes, I am. I am a king. Jesus is the prophet, the priest, and the king. He died on the cross and it was written, the king of the Jews. So he's a king. He's a king. And we are his servants. And we bow down to King Jesus and no one else. We serve Jesus our King. We are his slaves. We are his servants. He is our King. He's our King. He's our highest authority. Yes, we are in submission to governing authorities. But when our governing authorities command us to violate our higher authority, we must obey God rather than men. Jesus is our King. King Jesus and His Word. Our King left us His Word. And more and more in our culture, we're going to have to make a decision. Who do we obey? Men or Jesus our King? Now here's the fifth point of the cross, the demarcation of the cross. The cross, in other words, the cross divides. You're on this side or you're on that side. There's no neutrality. Look at Luke chapter 23, verse 39. You can't be neutral 
You have to take a side. You are either with him or you're against him. Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals... Now, Matthew calls, calls them robbers. There was two robbers on either side of Jesus. Now, these were not petty thieves. A robber was one who plunders, not a petty thief, but a cruel bandit who took pleasure in tormenting, abusing, and sometimes killing those that they robbed from. So these were serious felons. These were not misdemeanor cases. These were felonies. These robbers. These were criminals. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at Jesus. I mean, they're all crucified. Jesus is in the middle. One criminal and another criminal. One of them is hurling abuse at Jesus. Saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. What a powerful demonstration of the love of Jesus Christ that would save a condemned criminal right before he died. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, I'm going to die. You're going to die. I'll take you to paradise. Now, the cross, those two thieves... They represent the two categories of human beings. You're either for him or you're against him. Nobody's, nobody's neutral. On which cross are you? On which cross are you? Are you for him? Or are you against him? Can't be in between. You want to go to paradise. That's another word for heaven. You want to go to paradise when you die. You got to be for him. Now, by the way, this is a very unique situation. Sometimes people say, I want to be like the thief on the cross. I'm going to live like the devil and have my fun. And I'm going to... Indulge in every kind of sin there is, and then right before I die, like the thief on the cross, I'll get saved. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. This is a very unique situation. So don't expect to have a thief on the cross conversion. Because usually, 99% of the time, if you live your life like if you live your life in Satan's world and you indulge in sin, you will get so hardened by that sin, you will not be able to respond at the last minute. And you will end up where you deserve, in hell, because you would not serve Jesus. So the demarcation of the cross, and lastly this, the foolishness of the cross. Look at Matthew 27. Verse 39, 27, 39. And those...
passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. They're mocking him and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you're the son of God. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. And, he will re believe, and we, we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also... Everybody's insulting him. Everybody's mocking him. The robbers. But one of them changed. But at first, both of them were mocking him. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they were mocking him. The people were mocking him. Everybody was mocking him. What kept him on that cross? With all these people mocking you. What kept him on that cross? Love. Love for his father. He was doing his father's will. And love for those that would believe in him. And that's why people have a hard time believing in a crucified Savior. They want a super, a superman to believe in. Like Adolf Hitler. <clears throat> he wouldn't believe in that dirty Jewish Bible, that dirty Jewish religion. Christianity also. He called it a dirty, bloody religion with a crucified Savior. Who wants to believe in that? So he created from his inspiration from Nietzsche, the superman. The powerful man embodied in the Germanic people. He wanted nothing to do with that old dirty Jewish religion. It's foolish. And that's, people think it's foolishness. The foolishness of the cross. But, 1 Corinthians, our last verse, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 18. One eighteen. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? Like Hitler, it's foolish. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. To the unsaved man, it's all foolishness. How can you believe in God becoming man, dying on a cross? Foolishness. But that'll save you. That's the message that saves you. You've got to put aside your human vanity and your so-called intellectual supremacy. You put that aside and you accept the foolishness of the cross. And that will save you. Anything else will condemn you. So, beauty of the cross. The beauty of the cross. Let me just ask you this. What cross are you on? Are you ashamed of the cross? Don't be. Jesus wasn't ashamed of you. Don't be offended when you get pressed into service. You're in good company. Simon of Cyrene was pressed into service. 
Sometimes Jesus will press you into service. Hey, I need you. I need you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Come to the church. For what? I'll tell you when you get here. Just wear your dirty clothes. Praise the Lord. This coming Friday is Good Friday. Make it a, a day of remembrance. Remember what he's done for you. And then come on Easter Sunday. He died on Friday. But he rose on the first day of the week. To God be the glory. Let us bow in prayer. As we invite our usher forward. Our Father, thank you for the wonder of the cross. The preciousness of the cross. And Lord, we can only scratch the surface of its significance because it is so deep. And the world mocks the cross. For the cross is the central tenet of Christianity. Yes, God became man. Yes, he died on a cross. And he rose again on the third day. And he ascended back to the Father where he awaits his second coming to establish his kingdom. And Lord, we are those that believe, we cling, we love the old rugged cross where our Savior died. Father, now we pray you would bless tonight's offering and that you would take us from this place and help us to be those that pursue access to you for part of what you did on the cross is you made access to God a possibility. Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.